Uh -huh. Okay, welcome to this wild card session. First year classes doing wild card sessions. And um, I think Dean Sloat thought this is a really wild card if there ever was one. Uh, welcome to this session uh, with 12 papers from um, the class we've been having for the past semester on the visual culture of tattooing. Um, in which I should say, this is a serious academic uh, course, as you will find out in the presentation. We've been studying the history of tattooing from uh, as far back in time as you can think, and across uh, the entire globe. Um, so, as you will probably hear in several of the talks, uh, we are several decades into what has been called by um, Arnold Rubin, a tattoo renaissance, and so that concept of how popular tattooing has all of a sudden become will certainly appear in several of today's papers. The papers will be presented, they're very short papers, they're kind of a modified Pecha Kucha in the sense that they are slightly shorter than a Pecha Kucha. Um, but we just found out that we had trouble putting it on automatic advance here, so but their time to be about 20 seconds um, per slide. So you'll see about 15 slides per student, 12 papers, and without further ado, we'll start with Michaela Blanche, who is talking about tattoos and the workplace. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, I'm a junior here at Colby. My research Research paper explores tattoos in the workplace, and my research question is, does the presence of a visible tattoo have any implications in regards to employability and have any influence on one's decision to get a tattoo? The history of tattooing has an oscillating trend of societal perception. Captain James Cook is credited with introducing tattoos to the West in the mid-1700s. He returned from his voyages to the Pacific Islands with heavily tattooed natives who were publicly exhibited as human oddities and were contrasted with the civilized, unmarked Western bodies. However, in the 1980s, the leap in popularity of non-conventional holistic therapies and philosophies had an associated effect of opening Western minds to the acceptability of a variety of previously unconsidered ways of modifying the body including using tattoo as an expression of identity. However, do the savage origins of tattoos cast a prejudicial shadow on contemporary tattooed individuals? Studies suggest yes. Negative associations of tattoos and negative personal dispositions that were prevalent in the 1800s still exist in contemporary society for those who have traditional bold looking tattoos. Individuals with visible contemporary tattoos were rated significantly more positively than those with traditional <coughs> tattoos and were judged to be significantly more suitable for employment. These results suggest that the societal social stereotype of tattoos has changed somewhat in response to a wider adoption of body art practices today. However, the acceptance of tattoos in the workplace, no matter the subject matter, seems to vary among professions. For example, 7% of people in the retail business and only 3% in the hospitality business said they were willing to employ a person with a visible tattoo. Employers may require employees to have a well-groomed appearance and to comply with specific dress codes, such as prohibiting displayed tattoos. However, if an employee claims their tattoo is mandated by religious beliefs, then the employer cannot turn them away, but may ask them to cover up their tattoos. Recently, there has been controversy over such dress code policies. Sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, and cultural theorists have long recognized that fashion and other forms of manipulating appearance, such as tattooing, play a unique role in the development of the individual as a member of society, creating the negotiation and formation of the public self. Failure to explore freedom of dress as a unique right prevents one from gaining a complete understanding of what it is they are really doing when they get a tattoo, color their hair, etc. Personal appearance choices are important and unique in that this confrontation often represents one's separation from and identification with others in society. Still, placement of a tattoo and professionalism have long been linked. On a survey of nearly 3,000 tattooed people, only 12% reported having a visible tattoo that can be seen by coworkers during the workday, 
which is explained by the fact that 76% of respondents felt that tattoos can hurt an applicant's ch chances of being hired during a job interview. According to a recent poll, 17% of those with tattoos later regret it, and the reason most cited for feeling that way was because of the person's name in the tattoo. And surprisingly, only 2% said it was because of tattoos that because the tattoo affected their current job or their ability to get a job. Yet Gregory Roach, a cosmetic surgeon and owner of Bloomfield Laser and Cosmetic Surgery in Michigan, said he is amazed at how many people come to him for tattoo removals because their jobs don't allow tattoos. He's removed hundreds of tattoos and says the cost to remove a tattoo is almost 100 times more than to apply it. Although many employers have upheld dress code rules that restrict the visibility of tattoos in the work environment, I expect this to change in the next decade. A recent poll found that 36% of respondents aged 25 to 29 years have one or more tattoos, compared with only 14% of those 40 years of age and older. By the time this millennial generation is doing the hiring, there may be no need to explain the choice to get inked. Many see the recent tattoo trend as a natural evolution accompanying an era of young people who are much more open to self-expression and want to express their individuality. Some companies like Starbucks and PetSmart are changing their ways with their dress codes, however slowly but surely responding to this shift in mainstream culture. It seems that our accepting and generally more liberal generation may change the standards for tattoo acceptance in the workplace for the future, especially considering that tattoos are more popular now than ever before. Female pro professional athletes with tattoos are not your average woman, or athlete, or tattooed body. The combination of the three creates a unique subculture, and the media world doesn't hesitate to give them publicity. First of all, athletics are all about the body. These photos show how one photographer focused on capturing the ideal human physique for certain sports. In general, athletics are dominated by men, from the athletes and coaches to the reporters and commentators, Sports and the media surrounding them transmit the power of masculinity and athletics. Second, gender is all about the body. Historically, North American standards of feminine beauty produce a passive, untouched, and natural female body, whereas male masculinity is achieved through strength, aggression, risk-taking, and the ability to withstand pain or injury. This masculine authority is maintained through active biological and social control of women's bodies. But most professional female athletes have both physical and emotional masculine characteristics. This undermines the hegemonic, hegemonic ideologies about femi femininity, especially images of a weak, sexually objectified, otherwise submissive woman. The unnatural strength cultivated by female athletes creates both, both a physical and social power that challenges the established patriarchy. Third, tattoos are all about the body. Tattoos are permanently inserted just below the outer layer of the skin occupying a kind of boundary status, not quite on the outside, but also not on the inside. Alfred Gell famously calls it, quote, the exteriorization of the interior, which is simultaneously the interiorization of the exterior, unquote. Historically, tattoos were associated with toughness, um, sorry, danger and masculinity, often in reference to the exotic other, sailors, soldiers, prisoners, street gangs, rebel youth, and bikers. Tattoos were viewed as stigmatized symbols acquired as a sign of group affiliation or as ways to differentiate from the mainstream. The only females who were recognized as having tattoos were prostitutes and circus freaks. Nowadays, society tells us that the only acceptable tattoos for females are small, feminine, and easily concealed. For example, a dainty butterfly tattoo on the lower back. Although this is beginning to change, the majority of tattoo artists are men. Therefore, they can regulate what goes on in women's bodies. This further objectifies and sexualizes the female body. But these female athletes all have multiple large tattoos in public places that don't depict feminine, Im feminine imagery, such as flowers or dainty animals. Here, a swimmer sports a butterfly tattoo, but in no way is it small and hidden. It covers her entire back. A professional tennis player sports the quote, pain doesn't kill me, I kill the pain. So what is the, what is the meaning behind these large tattoos? Professional female athletes get tattoos for the same reasons everyone else does. This is Sydney LaRue. She plays for the U.S. Olympic soccer team. She has a large tree on her back with cherry blossoms dedicated to her mother. Her other tattoos are a way of expressing messages of motivation and reminders of life experiences. Brittany Griner of the WNBA has a sleeve on her left arm that holds a lot of nature imagery because she loves the outdoor. 
She also has a double-linked female sign that represents her sexuality. In an interview, she says, quote, society gives us a bad rep for having tattoos or being gay, so I'll just throw them both together in one. I want to be different, unquote. U.S. high jumper Anika McPherson has a tattoo across her chest that says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. She has red lips on her left cheek because that is where her family always kisses her. Her other tattoos include a tiger, a skeleton, a cross, and a hummingbird. She wants her, ne she wants her next tattoo to be a giraffe, which will represent her travels across the world. Natasha Kai of the U.S. Olympic soccer team has over 60 tattoos and a sleeve on both arms. Her tattoos celebrate Hawaiian pride, including the hibiscus on her right shoulder, Polynesian designs on her right arm and leg, and indigenous turtles on her back. She also has a tattoo with God's hands holding the Chinese symbol for believe, which is her Olympic team's mantra. So where does the media fit in? It's everywhere. <laughs> From video interviews on YouTube about specific athletes to New York Times articles about Olympic ring tattoos, there are hundreds of articles that pop up if you simply search athletes with tattoos. The presence of the media creates a world where the individual exists within a triad of the body, the self, and society. This goes to show how tattoos are never fully your own. Although tattooing is a way to construct oneself, it will always reflect cultural influences. Our physical appearance shapes our everyday interactions. Judgments can be made around an individual's social status, ethnicity, class, gender, and yes, even tattoos. The tattooed body speaks in a non-verbal way, allowing it to more easily be read by others. Of course, the media is interested in professional athletes because they are considered celebrities nowadays, but I believe whether they mean to or not, these female athletes are taking ownership and control over their own body by rejecting capitalist patriarchal prescriptions that define and regulate the appearance of the female body. today. Um, so, as we've talked about in Western culture, there is a strong distance between a tattoo's symbolic intentions and society's interpretations. Um, in the Pacific Islands, however, tattoos have maintained cultural acceptance. I wanted to know if within today's uh, tattoo renaissance that Veronique introduced, whether math tattoos were similar to traditional tattoos or if they shared more in common with contemporary Western tattoos. Um, first, we must look at the types of mathematical tattoos common today. Choosing to ignore mathematical symbols like the infinity symbol that have been reappropriated by t t contemporary practices, I found two major types of tattoos, equations and geometrical practices, um, tattoos. Um, equations, um, there are two very popular equations that popped up when I first started looking at this. Um, one is Euler's identity and the other is the quadratic equation. Both of these equations are considered to represent mathematical beauty, notably in their simplicity. Um, Euler's identity is derived from Euler's formula, which relates trigonometric functions to complex exponential functions. The identity is like the additive identity zero or the multiplicative identity one, and it helps simplify in trigonometric functions. Um, the quadratic equations, a lot of us have seen this in high school math. Um, this tattoo relates the fundamental theorem of algebra, which guarantees that there are at least two solutions for uh, polynomial of degree two, one real and one complex. Um, the other section is the geometric ta um, tattoos. Uh, geometric patterns have always been visually appealing, and they have also been consumed by the modern revival of tattoos. However, there are some geometric tattoos that can be observed within our strict mathematical framework. One popular geometric tattoo is a graphical representation of the Mandelbrot set. Shown here. Um, the most popular example is the visual representation of the golden ratio. The golden ratio appears in many different subjects, ranging from art history to fractals in biology. Um, and the golden ratio can be observed here, uh, superimposed over the great wave of Kanalanka. Um, that's a woodblock print by uh, Hakusai. Um, so, again, looking at where these fit in to our tattoo renaissance, um, we, gotta, we must look at uh, what defines contemporary tattoos. In order to place math tattoos, we must define contemporary tattoos. Since contemporary tattoos are rooted in unique personal meaning, the language is very expressive, yet the interpretation is left open. Furthermore, the contemporary tattoo is um, a creative expression, and the style and placement of these tattoos becomes a unique conversation between the artist and the tattooed. Mathematical tattoos differ from most contemporary tattoos in this sense because uh, their meaning is static. Um, the next thing we have to look at is uh, what defines traditional tattooing. Um, 
there, I found three key elements among traditional tattoos. These tattoos have coherent symbolic meaning. They're rooted in natural motifs. Um, they are part of a ritual rite of passage. And finally, they have a rigid design structure. Um, here's an example of the strict symbolic meaning in traditional tattoos. The spiral inside the eggplant flower symbolizes the beginning of a new life. Um, this Borneo tattoo, this is an example of a Borneo tattoo. Um, throughout traditional tattoo designs, there are many national um, forms that represent specific things from long life to fertility. Um, next is uh, an example of a ritual rite of passage found in um, traditional tattoos. This is an example of Paya. This Samoan tattoo practice is received by young men as a rite of passage and details the individual's ancestry. Um, historically, many other island nations held similar ceremonies, but the Paya is one of the few traditions that survived through Christian missionary intervention. Um, and then finally, this is an example of the rigid uh, structure of traditional tattoos um, from the Marshall Islands. The body is divided into three different zones. Each zone is named after different maritime structures. For example, the horizontal line below the navel is called the mast. Um, and this brings about, in the, in the 21st century, we're witnessing a growing neo-primitive movement. The modern primitive um, adorned traditional tribal tattoos, but much of the ritual has been lost. Well, neo-primitive um, tattoos certainly reject typical Western tattooing practices. They, fought, they fail to advance the Western tattoo, so the question, again, is where do mathematical tattoos fit in this? Um, the symbols of math equations have always been well-defined, thus any math tattoo shares a common language, much like traditional tattoos. The elements of Euler's, Euler's identity, for example, stand um, for very specific complex numbers. Like We're all very familiar with pi. Um, uh, since math is an abstraction of the world around us, it follows that much of mathematics is modeled after the natural world. Um, here we can notice the golden ratio is similar to the Bungaturum, which is uh, the Borneo tattoo we saw earlier. And we also, uh, this is a nice example of a shell that looks a lot like the golden ratio. Um, the math tattoo shares elements of traditional tattoos, namely their universal symbolic meaning and natural motifs. However, like neo-primitive tattoos, math tattoos lack any ritual components and rigid design structures. There seems to lack a common element amongst individuals who receive math tattoos and the style varies. Inspiration for math tattoos ranged from college students who were failing courses to PhD candidates celebrating their research to high school teachers attempting to connect with their students. While math tattoos are certainly distinct contemporary tattoos, it is hard to say if they will break free of this cycle of Western tattoos. My name is Tristan, and I'm going to be presenting on tattoos in the music industry. Tattoos in the music industry are intrinsically linked. My research explores the importance of tattooing in the music industry based on the importance of a performer's public image in contemporary popular music culture. Tattooing has been associated with criminality, cultural dissent, and sexuality. How Western society perceives tattoos has fluctuated over the centuries, from acceptance to rejection to ambivalence. Our relationship to tattooing is based on social norms. However, it can change within different subcultures and their presence in the mainstream culture. There is a remarkable use of tattoos in the history of the 20th century counterculture, which is defined by its rejection of mainstream society. While counterculture is most often associated with the hippies of the 1960s and 70s, the alternative values present in the counterculture were present in freak shows preceding them, as the remarkable appropriation of the word freak in the 70s reveals, and in the punk movement to follow. During the emergence of rock music in the 50s, these notions of fringe behavior and cultural disobedience, largely asso associated with the rock scene, connected people to their primal instincts. As alternative behavior and rejection of social norms seeped into mainstream culture, the associated physical characteristics, such as tattooing, seeped in with them. Thus, in the 1970s, Time magazine released an article that stated, after a decade or two of decline, tattoos are enjoying a tattoo renaissance. They've become the vogue of counterculture. Music icons such as Janis Joplin, one of the great female singers in rock history, were responsible for the transition of tattoos into mainstream culture. Joplin's tattoo, tattoo artist claims to have replicated her heart tattoo on over 100 young female fans, a number that has steadily grown since her death in October 1970. 
Rock and roll music is characterized by its defiant and rebellious behavior. Encapsulated in the phrase sex, drugs, and rock and roll, this ethos is embodied in the figure of the rock star, with sexuality, the body, and the danger of defiant behavior playing a determining role. Janis Joplin is a perfect example of the intersection between rock and tattooing. Her persona's overtly sexual dimension is perfectly illustrated by her tit tattoo. Thus, Joplin's body contributes to, to reflect her non-conforming sexual behavior. Justin Bieber, on the other hand, is the most widely recognized contemporary music figure in the world. He is also a prime example of the importance of tattoos in the music industry. His transition from 2007 YouTube sensation Teen Heartthrob to 2016 Bad Boy is not only reflected in his body image, but his expanding and shifting fan base. Bieber sports over 50 tattoos, covering a lot of his visible body. I argue that the increase in his tattoos over the past eight years is no coincidence. Their presence and visibility is absolutely critical in establishing his new image and gaining him street cred, cred among a new demographic of believers. Sociologist and tattoo scholar Michael Atkinson would attribute this transition to what he calls a body project. The deliberate modification of one's appearance in order to construct and represent identity over the life course. In Bieber's case, it is not just a body project, but as I'd like to suggest, a rock star project one that illustrates how performers can use their body to fashion their public image. Amy Winehouse had quite an extensive tattoo collection. The tattoos, paired with her exaggerated makeup and hairstyle, established her unique image and her association with multiple music genres. Among Winehouse's abundant ink, I'd like to consider here one in particular. As Atkinson states, tattooing has been historically relished within the male-dominated subcultures as a mechanism for creating and confirming aggressively strong or dangerous masculinities. Thus, Amy Winehouse's tattoo of a pinup girl under the words, Daddy's Girl, a tattoo that it should be noted she was asked to cover at the 2008 Grammys, challenges gender distinctions for its subject, which is stereotypically associated with lower class males. Therefore, Amy's body contributes to a public persona that goes beyond issues of class to produce a provocative discourse on gender. Through defiance of social norms, both rock and tattooing complement the efforts of one another. Tattoos enforce the edgy images of rock stars in a more permanent way, while musicians rock tattoos in order to confront society, a stance, it should be noted, that is expected of them. Thus, in order to construct a successful rock star image, tattoos can play a critical role. As Mary Cassette puts it, it is difficult not to recognize a tattooed body. Consequently, it makes perfect sense that the rock stars would use tattooing to enhance their countercultural image and, in so doing, further their branding and affirm their position as a music icon. I'm a senior and I will be talking about Yakuza and tattoos. Though Japan has had a rich history of tattooing, people with tattoos are often denied entry to swimming pools, public bathhouses, beaches, and even gyms. These establishments hang signs that read, no tattoos allowed. So, despite the apparent popularity of Japanese tattooing, why is there a stigma against tattoos in Japan? One of the reasons mainstream society rejects tattooing is because of the tattoo's long-standing association with the Yakuza, members of organized crime syndicates originating in Japan with over an estimated 100,000 members, which is over four times the size of the American mafia. Tattoos and missing fingers play an important role in maintaining their intimidating public image. Tattooing in Japan dates back to the Edo period in the 17th century, when criminals were tattooed as punishment making sure they would never be able to return to mainstream society. To reclaim ownership of their bodies, however, criminals would try to cover punitive tattoos with decorative, de decorative designs until tattooing as punishment was finally abolished in 1870. Japanese tattooing owes much of its growth and attractiveness in the mid-19th century to a popular Chinese novel called The Suikoden. The story is about a band of 108 outlaws fighting against injustice and corruption to defend the poor and weak. Some of these honorable outlaws were illustrated with conspicuous tattoos in widely circulated woodblock prints. Edo period kabuki plays featuring samurai, gangsters, and gamblers were successful because commoners could identify with their defiance of the ruling military class. 
As tattoos became more popular, playwrights incorporated more of them, frequently featuring a big reveal of a character's tattoos as a high point in the play. Beginning in the 19th century, negative associations with tattooing resurfaced, resurfaced during the Meiji period, when the Japanese government suppressed practices they feared Westerners would find barbaric. Thus, it makes sense that Yakuza gangsters would take an interest in tattooing after it was forced underground as a way to assert their commitment to life outside of the mainstream. Undergoing the expensive and time-consuming procedure of traditional tattooing also demonstrates one's ability to withstand pain. Using tabori sticks that penetrate the skin at a rate of 90 to 120 strokes per minute, a tattooist spends an hour working on just a few square centimeters by hand. It can take upwards of three years to complete a full bodysuit. The place of woman in the Yakuza has long centered around their roles as prostitutes, hostesses, and housewives for the gangs. Even when female <coughs> Yakuza bosses amass considerable power, they would never openly show their faces. Women associated with Yakuza get tattoos to express their loyalty to gang life. Despite their criminal nature, the Yakuza have enjoyed a certain degree of social acceptance in Japan. Thriving on their image as honorable outlaws, they continue to infiltrate Japanese society. Although still highly controversial, one police was quoted saying they would prefer, quote, un they would prefer organized crime over unorganized crime, end quote. <laughs> Yakuza like to see themselves portrayed as honorable and dignified Robin Hood figures who would never harm an innocent civilian. Implementing the Japanese tradition of Oyaban Koban, or literally, father role, child role, the Yakuza abide to a strict hierarchy system and they take paying one's dues and earning one's trust and respect very seriously. Like members of mainstream Japanese culture, Yakuza place great emphasis on saving face or maintaining one's public image and reputation. So integrated into society are the Yakuza that they publish their own magazines about gang affairs and hold televised press conferences to apologize for any trouble that gangs have caused to the public. From the early 1980s emerged the intellectual gangsters, the white collar crooks and financial racketeers, and then the economic gangsters who pushed gangs far deeper into corporate Japan. Moving away from the local and towards a more global mindset, the Yakuza are now opting for crimes of greater sophistication. During the 1980s, an estimated 70% of Yakuza had tattoos. These days, however, Japanese tattoo masters who once depended on Yakuza for business explain that Yakuza clients have dwindled significantly. Many modern-minded bosses discourage tattoos to avoid unwanted police attention. Some will tattoo only a simple phrase instead of committing to a full bodysuit. Older Yakuza are clearly not happy about the fading traditions. Kabuji Inagawa, one of Japan's most esteemed godfathers, warns that the new Yakuza are more violent, less obedient, and interested only in honoring fat prophets, not cool traditions. For these aging godfathers, they are no longer in full command of a generation raised with jet travel, television, leisure time, and growing consumer credit. The Yakuza have existed in a maze of contradiction being integrated yet rejected from society, <coughs> legal yet criminal. Their full bodysuit tattoos are also deliberately placed for easy concealment with clothing. Not only do Yakuza tattoos express their commitment to the gang and ability to withstand pain, but they also symbolize the Yakuza's uncanny ability to blend seamlessly into mainstream society, appearing and disappearing at will. Today, I'll be discussing the contentious issue of tattoos and Judaism. Due to the surge in popularity of tattoos in Western cultures that historian Arnold Rubin famously dubbed the, quote, tattoo renaissance, unquote, the morality of tattoos has become an increasingly pressing and polarizing issue within the Jewish community. Rabbinical assemblies have even convened to discuss the official conservative Jewish position on tattoos. Even those who are not familiar with the structural basis for the Jewish anxiety over tattoos may be aware of the urban legend that arose in mid-century America, that getting a tattoo means you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. No one is sure where this myth comes from, but it's simplistic and untrue. The root of the Jewish neuroses over tattoos comes from a biblical stricture on tattooing in Leviticus. 
Although there is some debate over the precise meaning of this passage, some Jewish scholars have suggested that it forbids only tattoos that depict idols or include the Lord's name, most Jews agree that regardless of semantics, the prohibition on tattooing is consistent with Jewish beliefs regarding the body. Jews believe that our bodies do not belong to us, but rather to God, and it is our duty to preserve them and protect them as God's property as long as we're renting them on earth. This philosophy transforms what could be a limiting rule into something empowering. However, the passage in Leviticus should by rights apply to all people of the book, that is to say, Christians as well. However, Christians have long abandoned this negative view of tattoos, and the annals of tattoo history abound with Christian tattooees, tattooists, and religious iconography. My research examines why Jews have uniquely retained these literally archaic sentiments and why that is just now beginning to change in this country with the recent proliferation of tattoos. Historians have discovered evidence that like most early cultures, the ancient Hebrews had tattoos, and even that Moses appropriated a tradition of mystical religious tattooing from adjacent tribes, but that this fell out of fashion before the common era, and Jews' lack of tattoos came to be a marker of their community like circumcision. Christians, on the other hand, abandoned the prohibition on tattooing early in their history when they reappropriated tattoos that their persecutors inflicted upon them as symbols of their righteous suffering, their empathy with Christ's passion, and their piety. Christian symbols continue to be popular tattoos today in this largely Protestant country. Jews, on the other hand, have had their suspicion of tattoos compounded by trauma. The specter of the Holocaust looms over any discourse Jews may have on the subject of tattoos. During the Holocaust, Jews in prisons in the Auschwitz concentration camp complex were tattooed with strings of numbers the Nazis ostensibly used for surveillance, but additionally used to dehumanize their captives. Therefore, for many Jews, tattoos represent centuries of anti-Semitism and the horror of the Holocaust. As Professor of Cultural Studies Judith Holland Sarnecki explains, the reason atrocious events are difficult to process is that we are incapable of experiencing them in real time. Rather, we constantly revisit them and are thus traumatized by them. Tattoos represent a form of, quote, creative mourning, unquote. They fill the void left by trauma and help us heal. Revealingly, many young Jews, especially descendants of Holocaust survivors, have recently taken to having their ancestors' numbers inked onto their own skin, while other Jews choose to commemorate the Holocaust in more radical ways. In the 90s, feminist activist and self-proclaimed public monument Marina Weinstein covered her body with Holocaust imagery, including crematoria, naked bodies hanging from the gallows, and the words, never forget. Weinstein reports that she chose to get inked in this way to inspire conversation about the Holocaust. Many young Jews are not so blatant in their symbolism, but I would argue that even if they claim their tattoos are purely fashionable, their choice to get inked cannot be made in a vacuum, and thus, in choosing to get tattooed, regardless of content, they are affirming their right to interpret their religion as they see fit, and they are empowering themselves against the global cultures that have historically inflicted cultural markers upon them, like the yellow stars of David the Nazis forced Jews to wear for identification purposes. Besides, the majority of the discourse on Jews and tattoos abounds with stories of Jews getting tattoos of religious content to celebrate their culture, despite the apparent paradox of breaking religious laws to do so. One tattooed Jew reported, quote, my tattoos do not keep me from connecting with God, it's the opposite. My ink is my covenant with myself, and I think God would approve, unquote. Indeed, such tattoos have gained such popularity in the West and in Israel, the very bastion of Jewish orthodoxy, that scholars are comparing these ritualistic markings and even suggesting that they may come to replace the traditional coming-of-age rituals of the bar mitzvah or the wearing of the yarmulke, in that the tattoo serves to deepen a personal connection with Judaism and mark oneself publicly as a Jew. To conclude, our class was lucky enough to be visited by Rabbi Alan Lucas, a Jew and tattoo scholar, who unequivocally said that he would not encourage or condone members of his congregation getting tattooed. However, he recounted stories of the powerful, poignant explanations Jews gave for their wanting to get tattooed and expressed that he recognized that their hearts were in the right place. Murderers can be buried in Jewish cemeteries, he reminded us. We are all sinners, and the tattooed ones aren't so bad. As tattooing continues to gain visibility in this country, it will be interesting to see how Jews use them to celebrate rites of passage, commemorate the traumas of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, and continue to redefine their relationship with their faith.
Um, hi everyone, I'm Emma, and I've chosen to discuss Native um, North Americans and tattoos. Tattoos have the ability to symbolize and represent a culture and the traditions within that culture. Specifically, I have chosen to answer and further understand what the role and importance of tattooing is in modern Native North America. Some of the tattoos that are considered Native American are more often than not cliche misinterpretations. With their iconography filtered through Hollywood and New Age spirituality, these tattoos bear little to no resemblance to Native American traditional tattoos. These interpretations appear in many styles, none of which are connected to traditional forms of tattooing. Here we see a flash-inspired teepee and a chief portrait done in a realist style. These, however, are not what I have chosen to focus on. Instead, my aim is to call attention to the traditional Native North American tattoos that are resurfacing today by and within tribes across the nation. First, an account of the traditional Native North American tattoo provides background on the importance within their different cultures. This includes various manifestations of religion, society, supernat supernatural beliefs, and medicine. Native peoples in North America are further separated by regions, the Arctic and subarctic, Northwest, Southwest, the Great Plains, and the Eastern Woodlands. Across the geographical locations, differences in cultural ideologies mentioned earlier are translated in, in the different roles and functions given to tattoos. Tattooing across time has been a type of marking used for many different functions, including identification, decoration, and spiritual purposes. I will begin with the description of the, his of the historical role of tattoos in the tribes of North America and then move on to the styles that are being revitalized. The Arctic and subarctic tattoos where, are where we find the oldest known records of North, Native North American tattoos, dating back to 3,500 years ago. They consisted mostly of bands on the face and limbs, specifically along the body's contours. These tattoos work to beautify the body, provide a sacrifice to gods, mark various life events, and shield the wearer from supernatural dangers. Northwest tattoos are primarily crests located on the arms and thighs and chest of the wearer. They are influenced by land and sea animals, birds, supernatural beings, and geographical features such as mountains and rivers. Many of these designs can be seen in the image on the left. The crests indicate the clan affiliation, thus participate in societal organization. Additionally, some are guardian tattoos, um, which are worn as protection. Southwest tattoos tend to be placed on the chin and limbs and mark the transition into adulthood, fulfill supernatural and medicinal roles to protect and heal, and also to act as honorific markings for warriors. Tattoos, like the one on the arm of the Toloa man, um, the image on the right, were used primarily in the healing of arthritis. Tattoos in the Great Plains appear on the torsos of men and face and bodies of women. Primarily serving as honorific purposes, the tattoos mark male warriors who, who were successful in their endeavors. The wives and daughters of these warriors receive full body tattoos as an additional mark of pride and celebration. The final major regional division in North America is the Eastern Woodland. Animals represented the primary source of their iconography. Each animal was thought to be some form of guardian or protecting figure. The great Mohawk war leader, seen in the middle right, wears a full body tattoo to give him the appearance of a war bird or spirit associated with success in war. As many Euro Europeans established colonies and expanded the American frontier in the mid to late 18th and early 19th centuries, some traditional Native North American practices were lost. These tattoo traditions that were central to the beliefs and traditions to the beliefs of the tribes were lost for nearly, for nearly 200 years, especially a result of the introduction of Christianity. Today, the remaining tribes and their descendants have worked to revitalize and reinterpret the practice. In each of the regions discussed, there is evidence of attempts to bring the practice back. The role of tattooing for the contemporary North American native is a powerful affirmation of identity. Through these marks, 21st century native North Americans are able to connect with their ancestors. Both style and technique play a role in the movement. Some revivalists choose to use the methods used by their ancestors. This often means that traditional designs are made by tapping on the skin, as seen in this image. Others use the modern technology of the tattoo gun to reproduce traditional motifs. Whatever the technique used for tattooing, they attempt to respect the traditional placement. While functions of the tattoo in this reemergence have been reconfigured to work mainly as group affiliation and affirmation of identity, their formal appearance remains remarkably stable. 
This is a photo of a woman in, of the Yupik tribe in Alaska named Yari. She has been a vital part of the 21st century reemergence of Yupik tattoos. Her chin markings are very similar to those seen in photographs and accounts of her ancestors. Like Yari, individuals in other tribes across North America are working to bring back, bring back the practice of tattooing. This is mainly intended as a means of creating a sense of identity for the wearer, not the function the tattoo fulfilled in the past. Native North America is a prime example of how tattooing has been and continues to literally mark a culture and its people. Hello, my name is Jack. I'm going to be talking about Neo Nordic tattoos. Um, so today, many different historical cultures are being appropriated for adorning the bodies of eager clients. I'll be focusing in particular on Viking and Icelandic iconography, which have blended together into a style that has been coined as Neo-Nordic by a renowned artist uh, named Colin Dale. So Neo-Nordic tattooing varies in its content, ranging from depictions of Viking mythological stories, as we see in the sleeves on the left, to combinations of runes or staves, as we see on the right. In some cases, artists will also use traditional methods of tattooing, such as hand poking or using natural pigments like ash, soot, or coal. The Viking Age took place between the late 8th century and mid-11th century uh, common era. The Vikings have a rich mythology and a very defined artistic style. <clears throat> uh, one of the most popular forms of Viking art still around today uh, is the art of the various stave churches, such as this one in northwestern Europe. Viking art is characterized by geometrical ornamentation and iconography of both real and mythological creatures. For this presentation, I'll be focusing uh, on the Viking runes as a concrete example. Those we saw before, this is just one part of the, uh, the Neo-Nordic style. Runes are individual letters that comprise runic alphabets, which were predecessors to the Latin alphabet, and multiple runes can be combined into individual symbols, as we see in the Bluetooth logo on the right, which are called bind runes. Almost everything in the Viking world uh, had a strong root in mythology. The story goes that the runes were originally symbols that were carved onto the tree Yggdrasil, seen on the left, determining the fates and destinies of the world. Odin gave up one of his eyes in order to learn these runes. With this knowledge, he gained the power to heal wounds, defeat his enemies, revive the dead, and perform many other feats. While the exact meanings of the runes remain somewhat cryptic, there have been many attempts to translate runic letters into Latin letters, so some people simply choose to get modern phrases tattooed with the runic alphabet. In some cases, this is done simply because people are looking to spice up some text that they were interested in getting tattooed, while others are looking to solidify a connection to their roots and their ancestors' culture. So this is Kiefer Sutherland, uh, 24, his runic tattoo. It translates to, I trust you to kill me. Uh, he says that he got it in order to remind himself that there are always people that will be coming after him. Uh, Sutherland's family is actually from Scotland, a country with many influences from when the Vikings occupied the country. So he may be attempting to invoke some of his heritage's history with this design. On the other hand, he may have just wanted an exotic looking design with a catchphrase. This is a tattoo of the Alger's rune. Uh, this is not a translation from a modern language, but uh, a single magic rune from the Elder Futhark runic alphabet, which is from roughly the 2nd to 8th centuries. Uh, and again, we do not know the exact meanings of these runes, as there is only speculation as to what they may have signified. It is widely thought that this rune depicts the upper branches of Yggdrasil, and thus the concept of being open and receptive to the heavens and the gods. So all of this begs the question, why, after almost a millennium, are these runes now appearing in such great numbers? I approach this question through the lens of the process of cultural appropriation and the motivation of modern-day tattooees. Colin Dale, the famous Neo-Nordic tattoo artist I mentioned earlier, uh, attempted to answer this by saying, quote, you look at these designs today and they're not something that is just in fashion at the moment. People get strength from connecting with the past, their roots, and their culture, so traditional tattoos sort of ground you. You can show who you are and it gives you something to be proud of rather than just looking good, unquote. It is clear that the primary purpose of appropriation of these symbols is that of solidifying identity. Tattoos today are centered on the notion that they can be used to make one's plain body more personal. As is often said in tattoo scholarship, by Alfred Gell, originally coined it, is that tattoos are simply an external manifestation of one's interior. Interestingly enough, there is a bit of a divide in the ways that people go about expressing this identity through runic tattoos. 
There are those who wish to preserve the historical meaning and others who disregard the history in favor of using the symbols as a vehicle for modern concepts. The Latin to runic alphabet tables are incorrect as runic alphabets are phonetic, so the characters from one alphabet cannot simply be mapped to another. One effect of modern appropriation of Viking iconography is changes in the runes perceived symbolic efficacy. There are people who get runes, tattoos, as a means to preserve and remember their heritage. But since many people are getting them tattooed merely as substitutes for our modern alphabets, there is no consensus as to which way we should interpret them. It will be interesting to see how this range in usage of the Nordic runes evolves in the coming decade. While it is possible that we converge upon universally respecting the historical settings and significances of the runes, it is more likely that we will continue to develop an entirely new interpretation of their meaning. The runes may very well become a simple visual substitute for our alphabet. This case study of neo-Nordic tattooing can be applied to other cultures whose iconography is resurging in the tattoo renaissance. These classic examples of the clash of modern culture appropriating old symbolism and contemporary attempts at preserving original meaning. Colby College. My research explores the area of shamanic tattooing among the Yupik of St. Lawrence Island, Alaska. I discuss shamanic tattooing practices as well as its influence over Yupik tattooing. My research also looks at the effect the tattoo renaissance holds for the Yupik. The earliest spiritual and religious practitioners were shaman. According to Michael Harner, author of The Way of the Shaman, quote, even in historical literature from classic Mediterranean, medieval, and Renaissance Western Europe, one finds the same basic shamanic knowledge once existed there until it was largely eradicated by the Inquisition." Unquote. Shamanism is the ancient universal tradition where personal and tribal healing are accomplished through a special skills of an individual. This individual, known as the shaman, transcends normal human consciousness and travels among different cosmological planes. Shamanic religious practices fueled by mystery and magic manifest the impossible and bring the imagined to life. The shamans are also artists who externalize their visions through ritualized speech, music, dance, and visual arts. Tattoos characterized by the ability they have to externalize the internal, become another visual art aid for the shamans who practiced it. For various shamanic tribes, tattooing became a way to satisfy the spiritual entities that they believe govern the world. Once the ink of the tattoo is marked, it becomes a permanent reminder of a protective shield, life lesson, or initi initiation. For the Yupik of St. Lawrence Island in Alaska, shamanic tattooing proved useful as a tool for medical and spiritual practices. In 1935, sociologists Anderson and Eels noted the healing use of shamanic tattoos among the Yupik. For example, Anderson and Eels noticed that among the Yupik, a permanent mark over the sternum was the shaman's prescribed cure for heart trouble. A small straight line over each eye was the cure for eye trouble. The healing ability came from a shaman's connection with the patient's skin. In Yupik culture, the tattoo artist was usually female. The permanent pigment she used, considered magical and used to repel evil spirits, the Yupik called the permanent pigment lamp black. Lamp black is made by collecting the soot from burnt, oily materials, such as pitch from trees, which was particularly successful in producing this black carbon pigment. Tattoos were marked on the joints in order to prevent transportation of evil entities into the body. Through spiritual guidance the shaman received, a tattoo was created. Breaking the barrier of skin and marking it permanently was viewed as the most direct route for the shaman and was regarded as culturally integral for the Yupik. In Yupik tradition, ritual bleeding and tattooing intersect. Licking the released blood during the tattooing session was a crucial part of the shaman's ritual. 
When the shaman consumed the blood orally or neutralized the blood with their saliva, it is believed that the evil spirit that possessed the blood would become eradicated, would be eradicated. Yupik women often have had specific tattoos done for protection and fertility. The Yupik recorded instances of protecting gar protective guardian tattoos that were done on the forehead, while str fertility stripes were placed on the cheek and chin. Joint tattoos were more commonly seen on the men. Skin stitching was the technique of choice among the Yupik shamans. With extensive practice as skin seamstresses, like making clothes, boots, or covers from hide, they were well suited for the application of ink soaked thread on the skin. <clears throat> for the Yupik, the position of the tattoos was essential. Visual analysis of these tattoos so that many of the Yupik tattoo locations correspond to classic Chinese acupuncture points. Also, like the acupuncturist and modern day doctor, the Yupik shamans identified the cause of the ailment or disease and then provided treatment. Today, we are in a tattoo renaissance, which is a term coined by Arthur Rubin used to describe the increased popularity of tattooing since the 1970s. Yet for the Yupik, missionaries in Western medicine have succeeded in effectively eradic eradicating many shamanic cultures. In early 1900s, the Yupik stopped tattooing themselves. Today, less than 10 Yupik have traditional tattoos, and the last trained Yupik shaman and tattooist died in 2002. In today's tattoo renaissance, Yupik children are learning about their tribe's relationship with tattooing through events such as Yupik Days, a celebration of Yupik culture held annually. Children participate in coloring of tattoos and coloring books facilitated by elders while learning about the important role these tattoos played in the life of their ancestors. In conclusion, the tattoo renaissance has played a positive role in reclaiming the cultural practice of shamanic tattooing among the Yupik. Thank you. And today I'm talking about uh, tattoos over scars um, that are not related to self-harm. So one method of coping with the aesthetic and emotional impact of scars is tattooing. In this presentation, I discuss the impacts of scars, which type of scars people cover, the benefits of tattooing to the recipient, and the mechanisms through which these benefits occur. Some amputees tattoo over the surface of the stump, but also choose tattoos related to the amputation in nearby locations. These tattoos not only are related to injury, but are also related to the loss of a part of their body. And these tattoos um, help to serve as a memorial to that loss. After mastectomies, many patients seek the help of a tattoo artist to conceal the marks of surgery. Many of these tattoos resemble bras and or have floral motifs and help survivors regain their femininity and feel beautiful again. Many of the scars covered with tattoo are those of domestic violence. These scars are the epitome of unchosen scars and tattooing over them helps victims to heal from the emotional scars of violence and regain power and control um, over their bodies taken from them by the perpetrators. Although more challenging, some people still choose to be tattooed over their burn scars. This can be problematic because burn scars often have an irregular texture, making it difficult for tattoo artists to achieve um, detail. Additionally, because of its texture, uh, tat er, burn scar tissue um, is harder to conceal. Reconstructive tattoos serve to make the person feel whole again, as well as bring some normalcy back to their body. These tattoos create the illusion that the injury or surgery never occurred. The most common type is areolar tattoos in mastectomy patients. Like the tattoos that cover mastectomy scars, these tattoos also help the women to feel beautiful and feminine again. Full healing of a scar, which can take a year or more, must occur before getting it tattooed. 
Tattooing over scar tissue is more painful than tattooing unscarred tissue, and scars take ink differently than healthy tissue, which is most problematic in tattoos that involve detail and color work. Many people choose t tattoos to conceal their scars entirely. This is sometimes because they are looking to remove the reminder of the traumatic event, or sometimes just want something more attractive to take the place of their scar. The positive memory of getting the tattoo can also help fade the memory of the original trauma. Still other people choose to make their scars an integral part of their composition of the tattoo. Sometimes this choice is made for them as some tattoo designs um, do not work over some, tattoo, some scars. Um, but other times they choose this method because they are proud of their scars and want to celebrate and remember them while also transforming. Whether the scars are from surgery, injury, illness, or violence, they were not chosen by their wearer and therefore represent a loss of control over their own body. Tattoos help them reclaim that control by being completely chosen and controlled by the recipient. Due to the emotional effects of trauma, but also the physical scars, people often feel a loss of identity after these events. The scars are alien to them, often done while they were under anesthesia. Being able to choose a tattoo that is distinctly personal to them can help that area of their body feel more like theirs. Tattoos over scars often come with a story about survival or regaining health after illness. These tattoos often mark the end of one chapter and the beginning of another, or the last stop in a long, arduous journey. The tattoos remind the wearer that they went through that journey, but are now on the other side. It is more painful to tattoo over scar tissue, but the pain is often welcomed by the recipients. Uh, as we know, trauma cannot be fully integrated until it is revisited, and having pain in that same area, once again, may serve that purpose. Emotional trauma can also be revisited with tattoos. The relationship between tattoo artists and their clients is unique. On one hand, they are total strangers, but on the other hand, they are sharing in a personal moment and a strong bond is being formed. Often, the tattoo artists are a large part of the emotional transformation and healing. In conclusion, tattoos are a common way to cope with many types of scarring and can help the re recipient regain their identity as well as their sense of control. It is painful and challenging to tattoo over scars, but often that pain is the draw for trauma victims who need it to fully heal. Thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Katie Southworth. I'm a senior, and my research is on women and tattoos. I specifically asked how women have used tattoos as a tool to overcome adversity since 1970. Tattooing in Western culture is currently in a state of heightened popularity ever since the revival of traditional art forms in the 1970s known as the Tattoo Renaissance. Women have taken advantage of this form of self-expression as a means of overcoming social and political, thank you, and personal adversity. Women's tattooing saw a revival in the 70s as a response to the feminist movement of the 60s. Women's bodies were, and still are, under immense societal pressures to fit a constructed, heteronormative, feminine image characterized by thinness, youthfulness, and docility. Tattooing started literally rewriting those norms. Women also started becoming tattoo artists in the 70s and brought a new feminine flair to the art form. These women inspired other women by breaking a gender barrier and also made it more comfortable for women to get tattooed themselves. Janis Joplin was one of the first celebrities to put tattoos in the mainstream. However, many others chose tattoos that expressed a new sense of self, reflecting the increased sexual independence of the 70s due to feminist developments like the pill and legalized abortion. In the 80s, the AIDS epidemic and tightening legislation on abortion created heightened anxieties and feminist activism over reproductive rights. 
Tattoos were questioned as to how much power they really held in terms of body ownership. Radicals like Christine Colorful confirmed that tattooed bodies could liberate an objectified body. She believes her nearly 100% tattooed body aggressively asserts her independence, her control over her body, her self-expression, and her transformation into an emotionally strong woman after having been sexually abused as a child. This use of tattoos as, a as, a, as symbols of personal growth and body ownership continued into the 90s as strong statements about identity politics. Tattooing blurred class and race lines, especially for women, and clients expressed desires for symbols that celebrated ethnic pride. Neo-primitives also arose in this decade. Members of this group embark on excruciating flesh journeys with the motive of reclaiming their bodies from the machines of modern life. Many women use these painful body modifications to express how women's physical strength can defy cultural expectations. Perhaps the most proactive use of tattooing originating from the 90s was the combination of cosmetic and artistic tattooing to cover up mastectomy scars. These tattoos allow breast cancer survivors to reshape their physical and sexual self-image, take steps towards emotional healing, and reach physical acceptance. Not only that, these tattoos also make political statements that challenge what it means for a woman's breasts to look normal. An alternative to prostheses, these tattoos create the illusion of something beautiful while maintaining the true physical remnants of a disease that is destroying women's bodies. The 21st century has also explored ideas of how tattoos themselves can be psychologically beneficial for healing through trauma. As visual aids, tattoos can transform bodies into memory-laden texts to which body owners can refer to at their own pace when in need of deeper processing of past trauma. Once the media came into play, everything changed. Reality TV shows like LA Inc. and the best-selling novel The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo brought the tattooing lifestyle right into the young women's living rooms. Women-run shops started popping up all over the country, which put women back in a power role in the industry. The internet has also allowed sharing of techniques and has inspired a sense of competition such that um, tattooists started seeking genuine fine arts training. Women were becoming well known for developing new styles and nowadays nearly every shop has a mix of male and female artists. Today women's tattoos are much more mainstream and accepted as a modern aesthetic just as is nudity and the use of veils. Thus, there is far less stigma hindering the dialogue over tattoos as they aid discussions surrounding body politics, gender norms, and social relations. So to conclude, no matter how simple or extreme, tattooed women are truly the owners of what Marco Mifflin calls bodies of subversion. Mifflin chose this phrase as the title of her book that outlines the social history of women and tattoos over the past century. Women who got tattooed then and are getting tattooed today are using this artistic practice to undermine the authority of both harmful patriarchal gender norms and adversities against aspects of their own identities. Henceforth, tattoos should be studied as an essential tool for understanding the ideologies of the very women who are rewriting accepted notions of feminine beauty and self-expression. Hi, my name is Molly Wu. I'm a sophomore and I will be discussing the relationship between self-harm and tattoos. Because self-harm is so often connected with different forms of mental illness, I will be discussing two major mental illnesses, depression and eating disorders, and the self-harm that results from them, and consider how tattoos are used as a form of coping mechanism for self-harm. Specifically, I will be looking into the reasons for which people who have self-harmed get tattoos. Over the course of this presentation, I hope to answer the following research questions. How does self-harm, practiced because of depression and eating disorders, affect the choice of tattoos? And do people who get tattoos do so for similar motives? In the book, The Tender Cut, Patricia and Peter Adler write, quote, Adolescents use self-harm as a mechanism to cope with the traumas typically associated with the dramatic and physical personal changes, shifting social alliances, identity uncertainty, raw nastiness, inarticulateness, insecurity, and general emotional trauma associated with the tween and teenage years of life." Unquote. 
The body plays a central role in self-expression, and people who self-harm write the text of their inner pain on their skin. There are many forms of self-harm resulting from depression, including cutting, burning, self-hitting, interference with wound healing, hair pulling, and bone breaking. When people, primarily youth who have self-harmed, get tattoos, they do so as a coping mechanism and also in hopes of preventing future self-harm. While tattooing can sometimes be considered a risk-taking behavior because of the pain experienced during the process and because of its permanence, tattoos are also used for positive reasons among self-harm survivors. Usually, people who have self-harmed choose to place their tattoos directly over their self-harmed scars. Often, people use tattooed words to cover their scars in order to not completely hide their scars. In fact, they are not looking to hide what they have gone through, but rather yet use tattoos as deterrents against future self-harm and therefore choose to have the scars act as, a as, act as a reminder. Females make up roughly 90% of people suffering from eating disorders, and approximately 3.5 of US females have had an eating disorder at one point in their lives. In Trauma and Tattoos, Judith Holland Saranecki explores the connection between tattoos, trauma, and healing. She defines trauma as an experience our psyche cannot fully comprehend. Eating disorders often are associated with psychological trauma. Tattoos help people suffering from eating disorders cope with and indeed process their trauma. Saranecki argues that tattoos serve as a visual and concrete reminder of the trauma which allows a permanent but controlled outlet for people to cope. The ED recovery symbol is composed of two lines that represent strength and recovery and is very common among survivors of eating disorders. This symbol is often found integrated into different tattoos, such as a flower that you'll see in the next slide. Andy Moore, a survivor of an eating disorder, says about her tattoo, quote, to me, it was a stamp on my wrist to remind myself daily of the people I met, both pa patients and staff. Remind myself of how sick I was and how sick I don't ever want to be again. Remind myself to eat, but mostly I wanted people to ask me what it was and what it meant. I wanted to be able to share with people the knowledge that an eating disorder is a mental illness and my getting sick with one was no different than me getting cancer or diabetes." End quote. There's a difference between tattoos chosen by people suffering from depression and people suffering from eating disorders. For instance, people suffering from dis depression get tattoos to cover scars of self-mutilation in an effort to deter themselves against future self-harm. In contrast, people who get tattoos after eating disorders don't usually have physical scars, so they get tattoos to symbolize recovery and to prevent from relapsing. However, there is a similarity that connects tattoos received by people who have self-harmed as a result of depression and those who have self-harmed as a result of eating disorders. Cutting and not eating are both unhealthy ways for people to claim control of their bodies. Such behaviors are coping mechanisms for people to release emotions when they feel they've lost control of certain aspects of their lives. Tattooing serves as an alternative and healthier way for people who have self-harmed to cope. Additionally, tattoos serve as a way to claim ownership of the body. Historically, criminals used to be tattooed by the state to show ownership and power. Today, many people with depression and eating, eating disorders who have self-harmed are getting tattoos for the same reason. Project Semicolon is trying to work towards ending self-harm and lowering suicide rates. Project Semicolon's motto is, quote, a semicolon is used when an author could have ended a sentence but didn't. You are the author and the sentence is your life, end quote. Project Semicolon's vision is to create a world with lower rates of self-harm and suicide by creating a movement and conversation about suicide, mental illness, and addiction that can't be stopped. Tattoos serve as a power permanent display on the skin. While some self-harm varies greatly depending on mental illness, tattoos continue to serve to represent ownership, recovery, and resilience. Thank you, Thank you Molly. We have about 10 minutes or so. So I would like to invite you all to come to the podium and see if there's any questions from the audience for um, your 12 papers. Anybody? It's always the first one that's the hardest. Come on, someone's got to have something you're wondering about. Who are the two who got tattoos? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you guys, you're on. <laughs> well, no, several have, oh. have tattoos already, but it is true what, what Rob is mentioning is that during the course of the semester, two students uh, got real tattoos and 
one kind of tried it himself. So you want to talk about your experience? Hi. Maybe come here. Talk it. Uh, well, I did get one. <laughs> uh, I joked with Veronique that it didn't have to do with her class, but rather that I had to wait until my swim season ended. So <laughs> it was just kind of awkward like that. But no, I got my tattoo and it was very um, cathartic for me and sort of was the basis of why I chose the topic that I chose um, for my research. Um, I found that it uh, helps me with deeper processing a trauma I've been through and um, also sort of marks um, uh, an autobiographical moment that I can uh, continue to learn from every time I look at it. So that's where it came from. Um, I also got a tattoo while in this class. <laughs> um, it was my first tattoo, and I also, like Katie, had to wait until swim season ended. Otherwise, that doesn't do good things for the healing process. <laughs> Um, I got a little wave on right on the left side of my rib cage, and my father drew it. And my dad's an artist, so I thought it'd be nice to have like a little piece of his artwork um, to keep forever. And um, the wave represents swimming, and it can also represent strength and overcoming struggles and stuff like that. Um, and I jokingly, when I posted it on Instagram, said that I wanted to get extra credit in my tattoos class, but I was totally kidding. <laughs> 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 They're not getting extra credit. <laughs> yeah, right, all the sad, like, five are going to get tattoos tomorrow, right, as the semester is wrapping up. No. Any scholarly question? <laughs> well, then let's wrap it up. Thank you so much.